Welcome to the podcast that will teach you how to successfully invest in and build steady streams of passive income from the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Veteran real estate investors Kevin Bupp and Charles Dehart from Mobile Home Park Academy will personally share with you the valuable lessons they've learned along their journey as mobile home park investors so that you too can learn how to build massive cash flow and huge profits from this extremely lucrative niche. So without further ado, let's welcome your hosts for today's show, Kevin Bupp and Charles Dehart. Welcome, guys and gals, to the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. We'll provide all the information that you need to know to successfully locate, negotiate, close on, and make huge profits from the lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. I'm your host, Kevin Bupp, and I'm joined today by my co-host and business partner, Charles Dehart. Charles, what's new, my friend? Nothing much, man. We are just rocking and rolling over here at Sunrise, so... Uh Definitely enjoying the ride. Yeah, yeah. It's been a busy one, hasn't it? <laughs> it has. <laughs> yeah. Well, that kind of leads us into uh, what we'd like to cover real quick, just some housekeeping items before we, before we get onto the show with you guys. Uh, first and foremost, as Charles had mentioned, we're rock and rolling. I mean, we're busy. We've got a lot of deals on the board, lots more coming into the pipeline. And so we need to expand our staff. And so we're hiring. And uh, so if you have an interest in, in learning what we have to offer here and you've been looking for the opportunity to join a just a team with this top-rated talent, We'd love to hear from you. You can actually go over to careers.sunrisecapitalinvestors.com to learn about the current opportunities that we have to join our team. So we'd love to speak with you if you have an interest. Next up, Charles, I know that you and I last last year, last uh, October, I think it was, we did a due diligence seminar, two-day due diligence seminar in sunny Orlando, Florida. Uh, we own a community just north of Orlando and um, we took a group of folks. Uh, I think there was about 40 of us that jumped in a bus and we spent two days going through a community that we had just purchased there and we actually recorded the whole thing. So, um, and we just, uh, we launched this free video giveaway a couple of weeks ago for you guys. This is something that uh, many folks, like the 40 that were there, uh, paid a large amount of money to attend and that we're now making available for free uh, just to show our gratitude for you guys being a loyal listener to the show. And so this video is a it's a two-hour uh, mobile home park due diligence training video where we literally are inside the mobile home park. We walk you through that, that acquisition that we had just made and what we had intended to do to turn it around. And uh, there's no strings attached whatsoever to get access to this video. All you got to do is go over to dd.sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. Again, that's dd as in due diligence dd.sunrisecapitalinvestors.com to grab your free copy. And um, it's two hours long, so there's lots of information there, you guys. In fact, I suggest that you probably get a notepad uh, before you sit down to watch it, and I hope that you can find a lot of value in that video. In addition to that, we've got a lot of opportunities today. Uh, we made a good number of acquisitions last year, got lots of things in, the, uh, in contract and also in the pipeline coming behind that. And so if you're an accredited investor and you have an interest in uh, potential partnership opportunities with our team uh, here at Sunrise Capital Investors, you can go to our website to learn more about that. And sunrisecapitalinvestors.com, you go there, uh, click on the investors link, and it will take you to all of our current offerings that we have available. And lastly, guys, we're very grateful to be putting these shows on for you each and every week. We love doing this. We love giving back value. And uh, all we'd like to ask in return for that is if, if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes, go subscribe and rate and review the show. It really helps us drive um, both the listener base, but also just it, it helps us attract quality guests to the show. You know, every once in a while, we'll bring a, a guest on the show, an owner, operator, or a vendor that services this industry. And so and it also allows us to get better feedback from you guys as to what you like, what you dislike about the show. Maybe if you have a, a show suggestion that you'd like to hear, a topic that you'd like us to cover in a future episode, um, you can do that if you go over to the uh, rating section in either iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or SoundCloud. There's many other places where a lot of you listen to us. Uh, but go in there and leave that rating and review. And if there's something that you'd like to suggest for the show, again, a topic, you can also place it there. And Charles, with that, let's, uh, let's talk about what we're going to be covering today. I know that um, this is our second part of our three-part series that, you know, we, we kind of sat down in our office and we put our brains together and we're like, you know, what are the big, what are the biggest challenges that folks getting into this business are facing? And, um, and we can easily step back into their shoes because it hasn't really been that long that, you know, myself, you and Brian have been in the space. Uh, you and I are, I guess it's what, five or six years or so, um, mm -hmm. you know, from the point in time we dove uh, into this mobile home park investment space. And, 
you know, we were, we were brand new at that point. We didn't know anything. We were wet behind the ears and there were numerous challenges that we faced. And, and so we know there's many others out there facing these exact same uh, issues and, and struggles. And so we put together this three part series designed to really get you guys off on the right foot. And so last week, I know that you and Brian, I was at, actually out in the road. And so you and Brian uh, did a show together and you went through our broker initiative program or essentially our uh, proprietary broker campaign formula that, that we use in-house and uh, that will essentially help those new investors navigate the, the complicated maze of establishing those high quality broker relationships, which is, it's really challenging when you first getting started. Uh, it's, it's really hard just to get brokers to take you seriously, uh, especially brokers that have any, um, any knowledge in this, in this space. And so I know we struggle with it in a great deal. And, and you kind of developed this initially. You developed this program and, uh, and it literally helped you land, uh, you know, that first deal, the first deal you ever tied up in the contract. And so um, it's a big part of our business and it's a great way for you know, those that are getting started to dive in and really start having some deals flood their way from brokers working on their behalf. Today, Charles, today is where the magic really starts yep. unraveling. And this is, um, at least my personal opinion is, it's what I feel is probably the most important technique to master, not necessarily just in the mobile home park space, but just as a real estate investor. And that's picking the right markets to invest in, right? If you don't have the right, if, if you can't figure out how to invest in the right market, then nothing else really matters because at the end of the day, Charles, and we've seen them, there's, there's many pretty mobile home parks in really crappy markets, right? And uh, just because it's pretty and it looks great and it's the right price, doesn't mean much if the market can't support it, right? If the local economics of that marketplace are terrible, if people are leaving in droves and, and the jobs are going away, you know, what, does it matter if your park's pretty or not? Probably not. So today is going to be a vitally important component of being successful in this business. And then um, next week, we're going to, the third part of the series, the third and final part of the series, we're going to cover that final missing piece of the puzzle, which is uh, really, it's a uh, direct complement to choosing the market because this next piece is really what's going to separate everyone from their competition. I know it's really what's allowed us to separate ourselves from the other mobile, mobile home park investors that are out there today. And that's, that's how we continually get incredible off-market deals up on our, in our pipeline. And I'll tell you that, and you guys probably know this as well, if you're out there hunting for deals, that they're tough to find, right? I mean, we're reaching peak market cycles in, in certain areas of the country and competition. I mean, it's really at an all-time high. In fact, you know, one of the things I've noticed changing, Charles, uh, on a regular basis is apartment investors, right? Multifamily is like the hot ticket today. Everyone talks about multifamily. And one of the big things that's happened over the last couple of years that I've noticed is the ones that would probably have stuck their nose up at our, at our space two years ago, guess what they're doing now? <laughs> they're, they're coming over to our side, right? I'm sure you've seen the same thing, haven't you? Uh, yeah, I have. And uh, one of the, I guess one of the most enjoyable parts about, uh, about watching those guys come into the space is uh, I think they're used to, uh, to, to working with brokers who are, uh, I think on the apartment space, they, there's a lot more tactics they can employ uh, with brokers. It's, it's so much more localized for them. And uh, when they come to this space, they, um, they, they really struggle hard because a lot of them don't come over here with the database. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, they go out and try to do big capital raises and then find out uh, deal flow is not there for them. It's really interesting to, to, to see all of these, uh, you know, quote unquote, sophisticated investors coming into our space and then struggling. It's really, you know, when you go back to the database stuff, it's, um, that's a competitive advantage that, that you can have uh, pretty e easily over those guys. Mm -hmm. So. Which is what we're going to teach them how to do, right? Next week. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's really it. That is the, uh, th that is the way that, in fact, I'm going to, I'm going to mention this. I had a, we had a call with a, a potential investor the other day and he had asked the question and he's very familiar with our space, Charles. Um, he had asked the question more specifically to me since I handle a lot of the acquisitions on our side is how have you guys been able to continually bring deals in uh, when the other operators that I am familiar with are saying that it's really tight, that you know, deals are really lean and uh, there's the opportunities are few and far between. And uh, I mean, really the secret, it's not even a secret anymore because we're telling it to you now is, is the database has allowed us to do that. Of the deals that we have in contract today, only one is from a broker. And we've got, uh, I believe seven or, eight, seven or eight deals currently today in contract and only one of those is from a broker. 
And uh, so if that, if that means anything to you whatsoever, it, what it should, what you should be able to take from that is that this database is vitally important if you guys want to be competitive in this space. And so, Charles, let's, let's just move on to it. Um, let's talk about, you know, I guess first and foremost, how, do, how does one even go about choosing a market, right? I mean, there's, when you really break it down to, you know, MSAs and then you got the secondary and tertiary markets and the frontier markets and then, you know, areas that aren't even in an MSA. I mean, there are thousands of markets just in the United States alone. So where does one start? Yeah. And I want to, I want to kind of back up a little bit here. The, um, the approach that we're going to take in this episode is, is, um, it's a little bit different than analyzing a mobile home park deal and figuring out if it's in the right kind of market. This is, you need to approach this from the standpoint that you're analyzing a market first and then building out a database and then targeting those mobile home park owners. So it's a little bit different. The methodology is a little bit different. I know that when we get deals that come into our pipeline, we'll start with the city, we'll move to the county, we'll move to the metro area mm-hmm. and sort of take it in that order. So we'll take it on best places in that order, look at the, st- the statistics, and then we'll look at Wikipedia in that order and read about the, the town, the county, and the metro area. Mm-hmm. But in this case, you're going in the reverse order. Uh, not even really, the, you're really skipping the county and the, and the city uh, in most cases. You're just really focused on the metro area. Um, and when that deal comes through from your, from your database campaigns, that's when you really focus on county, uh, city. So when a deal, so, like, so for instance, for us, when a deal comes through our database, we've already vetted that metro. So it's, um, it's already a known entity. We already know that we're interested in, in investing in that metro area. So today we're just going to really approach it from the standpoint of, of metro areas. And the and reason this is important is the last thing you want to do is build a database to spend the time and energy into building a database uh, in an area where it doesn't meet your investment criteria. That would be mm-hmm. um, a really dumb mistake to make, but it's easy enough to do. Yeah. And how many markets, Charles, do you think you've researched uh, over the last four or five years that you've been building out this database? Um, we're at the point now where I think about the only, there's only like four or five states we haven't done. Mm-hmm. And I know in the United States, I, can't, I mean, I can give you an estimation, but the United States, I think there's like 700, a little over 700 metro areas, metro statistical areas. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the exception, I mean, every state that we're in, we've researched every metro in that state. So mm-hmm. in 45 states, we've, we've at least researched all of them. Um, I don't know, probably close to 700. Okay. Yeah. Say. A lot, a lot. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. a big number. Fantastic. So where do we start? Um, the, I think the best place to start is going to be best places. I think it's best places.net. So it's not .com, it's .net. Mm-hmm. And it's really, really super simple to do this. Um, you know, most people have a general idea of where they want to invest as far as what state they want to invest in. Um, one of the things you can do if you're looking at states is just kind of get a, a general feel for uh, what the landlord tenant laws are in that state before you commit to a state. So I know that uh, one of the things that we had done really early on, when we were building our database. Delaware was a state that we, that we liked, but since then Delaware has now instituted rent control. Um, it's not quite as bad as other areas as far as our rent control. We still market there. But um, I think looking back, if we had known rent control was coming down the pipe, uh, we, we might not have prioritized it that early mm-hmm. as being a state that we, uh, that we went after. But um, so definitely look at the state landlord laws first. And uh, there's some that are, because in Delaware, the rent control is really specific to mobile home parks. So if you're going to... Um, to commit to a state, I would say that your first action step would be to call the, the State Manufactured Housing Association and get a rundown on, on sort of the overall landlord-tenant loss just to get a, a general feel for, for what business is like in that state. So that's probably the first thing I would do. But once you get your, got your states nailed down, then all you got to do is go to best places and you'll, you'll scroll down to the bottom of the, um, of the front page and you'll see a map. And all you do is just simply choose the state. And uh, from there, very, very simple, there will be a ribbon. Uh, once you click on that, there'll be a ribbon sort of at the, at the top that says cities, metro areas, counties, and zip codes. And uh, then you just go to metro areas, and it'll give you a list of all the metro areas in that, in that state. And all you got to do is just simply open all those windows up and take a look at the stats. And then you'll go on Wikipedia and do the same thing, read about the metro, 
sort of what you're looking for on Wikipedia is just to make sure that the Metro has diversity of employment. And usually they'll give you like the top employers and they'll tell you a little bit about the history and, and what the what the Metro is known for and, and things like that. So you can get a pretty good general feel from that. What are some of the economic fundamentals that you're looking for? I mean, when you're looking at a specific MSA, you're looking at unemployment, you're looking at, um, you're trying to figure out job growth, you're looking at the population, uh, median household income. So w- what are some of those uh, particulars that, that the folks that are listening need to address when they're researching these different MSAs? Yeah, I'm going to take this from the standpoint of uh, someone who's a beginner. Yep. Okay. We, so we can stray from some of these general rules of thumb because uh, we can do, you know, we've been in this game a lot longer than a beginner has. And we, we, we sort of know um, how to kind of bend the little rules and, and still make it work. But uh, as a general rule of thumb, you're looking for metros that have a population of 100,000 people. Um, and I would say if you're beginning, I would, I would almost set that in stone as concrete for you as a beginner. Now, once you get your first couple of parks under your belt, you can start looking at smaller metros. But uh, most cases, a 100,000 person metro is going to have diversity of employment. And uh, it's going to be fairly, you know, it's going to have, you know, a, a lot more infrastructure and, and uh, you know, investment into that, into that area. Um, so I would focus most of your attention on a 100,000 person metros and up. And um, there's plenty of those. Like you, you won't have any shortage of metros to invest in uh, when you limit yourself to 100,000. The next thing I would focus on is median, median income. And uh, what you really want to do, and again, you can stray from this a little bit as long as you know the reasons why you're straying from it. But you want to see that median household income is right around 40,000 and up. Now, there's some areas where they might be vacation areas and the, the way that they, they gather their statistics may give you a false impression of what the actual true median uh, household income is because it might be sort of a retirement area. Like in Florida, you'll see this. Um, but overall, $40,000 and up for your median income, that's, that's where you're going to want to, as a beginner, you should probably just set that one in stone as well. Um, and then average home prices, I would say $100,000 is your, your average home price. Again, you can stray from this a little bit as you get more experience, but as a beginner, set that one in stone as well too, because you don't want to compete with stick built housing or apartment housing and things of that nature for your mobile home park. Got it. What are, what are some of the big red flags when you're going through those different stats? Generally speaking, what are some of the big red flags that jump out at you? Assuming that everything else meets the criteria, hundred thousand population, um, you know, median home prices are right in line, but what are some of the red flags that jump out where you dig a little deeper? Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the big red flags for me are, you know, once we get past that initial stage, I like to look at unemployment rate. That's a, that's a, that's a really big one for me. Um, and then I, I also like to look at the industries that are very prevalent in that area and just sort of try to imagine where we are in the market cycle. You can't really predict what's going to happen in the next downturn, but if, if an industry looks like it's going to be somewhat dangerous, um, we ran into this a little bit in West Virginia last year with, with uh, a park that we almost bought. Um, it, it had still, a, you know, it was Charleston, West Virginia, um, over the years had really gone away from coal, uh, but they still had a lot of their economy based on coal. And, you know, coal is not a very safe uh, thing to put your investment dollar behind. So, Um, I would definitely take a look at the industry and then how the employment picture is in that area because, uh, and and really focus on, focus on the, the types of jobs where your tenants are going to be working on too, and try to figure out, you know, what's going to happen in those industries when, if a big factory shuts down and, and most of your tenants are laid off, you know, so really, you know, you want to game plan, uh, sort of in that, in that way that you, you just want to avoid areas that have dangerous industries that are very prevalent and have high unemployment or really just major fluctuations in unemployment over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want to avoid those. Um, housing vacancy is another one that can sort of drive down home prices if it goes on long enough. You know, I wouldn't set that one in stone, but you typically want to be, you want to have your, your housing vacancy like around 12 to 14% or lower, you know, so somewhere around the national average. Uh, but if you look at vacation areas like Florida, you'll see some areas that are, that are upwards of 25, 30%. And it really is just, it's the way they gather their stats. So again, if you, if you see an area that's otherwise, you know, everything is fine, everything checks out and there's this big housing vacancy, 
if it's a sort of a vacation area or retirement area um, where people have second homes, that that is usually the reason why it's so high. So you don't you don't need to you know kill it just on just on the strength of one indicator. You don't you don't kill an area, but you you definitely want to try to understand uh, what makes that market work mm-hmm. and what the what the risks are. So it's just sort of a SWOT analysis. Yep. And it, just speaking from the beginning, just getting started, how many markets so that one doesn't get overwhelmed? How many markets do you feel they should start this, this project out with? I mean, is there a, just a handful just to get the lay of the land or um, what are your suggestions? I would focus uh, more on the size of the database. So okay. when you look at a market, you can, you can certainly go and, uh, and we're going to go over this more in the databasing section, but you can go on MH Village and it can give you a list of all the mobile home parks in a metro. So when you look at that list, uh, you can kind of estimate sort of, you know, about, you know, we, we like to do 50 spaces and above and about, uh, about 25% of that list will be 50 spaces and above. So if I, if I go over to MH Village and I see uh, like for Tampa, for instance, I might have a thousand parks in it. I know that probably around 250 of those are going to meet our criteria. Mm -hmm. So, um, what I suggest is that your database needs to be about 500, uh, unique owners. Um, that sort of guarantees you success if you, if you market to that consistently. So if you're in the Midwest, you need to have probably 15, 20 markets, uh, to get that. But if you're in some of the Southeastern markets, especially in Florida, or if you're out in California, if you're doing California stuff, um, some of those markets, have a ton of mobile home parks in them and you might get away with only having three or four. Mm -hmm. So it's largely dependent on, on how big your database can be with the markets that you've chosen, but you want to pick enough to where your database is big enough. Okay. So it's, it's more so listen to this show, listen to next week's show that we're going to come out with regarding the database component and then tie the two together and really base your criteria on number of markets on getting to that first, I guess, threshold of 500, right? 500 total owners, within that database. And if that takes you three MSAs or 10 MSAs or 15, whatever it might be, that's your number. Then that's the target that you're going for. Is that what you're saying? Yep. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Yep. Fantastic. What else, what else do we need to know about market selection and research uh, to get us on the right track, Charles? This again, this will be a little bit easier once you, um, once you get the database show, because we're going to show you how to, uh, to look at parks on Google earth. One of the things that you want to pay attention to is the vacancy of the mobile home parks in that market. So if, if we're going to go into a new market, one of the action steps we always do is I'll go to the, uh, the main city of that metro and I will look at, I'll just, it's really easy to do. You just type in mobile home park on Google earth and it'll take you to, you know, five or six of them. And then usually you'll find others as you're, as you're looking around, uh, mobile home parks tend to be clustered, um, in, in markets. So, uh, what I like to do is I like to look at what type of vacancy they have as far as vacant pads. That's usually it's not always an indicator, but it, it, it can be an indicator of, of the, the metro being overbuilt uh, for mobile home parks. Like uh, Wichita, Kansas is an example that's of it. a I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's a market. We, we sort of avoid Wichita because of the, um, it's overbuilt. And then there's been, that market has just sucked in a lot of large operators. Um, and it's highly, highly competitive. So we avoid it because, you know, we don't need it. Uh, to be successful. So basically we'll look at that and then we look at the ownership profile of the market. So this is especially true when we get a deal under contract, but before we even go into a market, I like to look at who else is it, is there. And that's a lot easier as you get more experience to, um, you know, to the, the stuff we're going to show you on Google earth will give you the, uh, the address of the owner and uh, large owners. I already know the addresses of all the large owners that they send their mail to. Uh, so I can easily go through and, and know if it's going to be a Sun Communities or an ELS or an RHP Communities or, or whatever. And uh, we like we like being in the same markets as those as those operators because they're very predictable in the way they push their rents, the way they push the market, and um, and really they they they're just uh, they're they're good for us as as owners to be in the same market because it just it helps us drive our investment. Mm-hmm. And you also got to think it's kind of like how, you know, you, you look at retail, look at the habits of different retailers in an industry. And uh, if you see that 
Walmart, Target, um, Chipotle. I'm just throwing out the names that are coming to the top of my head. That you know that they've done their research. That they've spent a lot of money and energy doing their due diligence and research on a particular marketplace. And it just it offers some confirmation to us as investors that, hey, these larger operators are in the space. I mean, they've done their homework. So my the homework that we've done internally, it's adding up and it looks as though this is a great place to invest. And in. basically, they're giving me confirmation that it is because they've got you know X number of lots in this marketplace. So I know that's a, that's a comfort thing as well internally when we see the other operators are in their spaces. We've covered a great deal here, but are there any other items that we need to know uh, to, to actually get really good and competent at this market analysis process? There's a couple of smaller indicators, but I would almost say that those sort of belong at a more micro level, like the, the rates of, uh, you know, what, what apartments cost, you know, the, the ratio of homeowners to renters, you know, those are all nice to knows. Um, you know, when you do this market research, this isn't just a five minute exercise and then put it on the list. I mean, you, you should understand the, the market. And really, if you're, if you're just getting started, and you're only really trying to go after 10 or 15 markets, then you might as well spend some time understanding everything there is to know about that, that market, at least what you can find on Wikipedia and best places. Mm-hmm. So you can go through everything and uh, look at all of them. It gives you the, um, the statistical national average for every single stat to compare to. And then additionally, in best places, you can compare one area to another. So if you're, if you're saying, I don't know whether I want to invest in Atlanta or if I want to invest in, let's say, Charlotte, North Carolina, you can line those two metros up beside each other and do a comparison um, hmm. very, very easily. And uh, so, you know, it, it's, you just take some time and you, uh, and, and you just kind of, there's a few things you got to set in stone, but otherwise... You're just you're trying to make sense of the market and know what the risks are. Again, it just goes back to a SWOT analysis. Yep. Let's. I want to. I want to reference an episode that we just came out with a few weeks ago with uh, with Kirk Bosch. Uh, he was actually one of our students last year, uh, Charles, in our uh, MHP Academy. Kirk's one of those individuals that really took this to heart. I mean, the actual market and database process. And um, has just really grown by leaps and bounds over the last year. And so let's let's talk about that a little bit because really he 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 took what you gave him as far as like your I mean one of your big core companies, Charles, is like literally you are an expert at 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 researching markets and the databasing process. I mean, you know probably more than I don't know ninety nine point nine percent of the other operators out there in our space about each one of these individual markets that you spent time researching over the last four or five years. And so, but Kirk, he kind of took what you had already done and just put it immediately into action. And um, his database is quite large. I know today he's got a team of VAs working for him in the Philippines and uh, he's on track. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Charles, he's launching literally at the point where he's even launching a fund, which is kind of unheard of for someone that's only been in the business for, I guess, less than a year at this point, right? He's launching a, a three or $4 million fund to date. Yeah. I would almost consider, I mean, I've, I've worked with Kirk on a lot of projects regarding the, um, you know, analysis of different areas. Um, he's been, you know, when we met Kirk in our, in our academy, he had, uh, we had only had our database built out for about half the country. We kind of stopped because we were really focused on that, on that Eastern half of the country. And it's really been working with him has started to develop that Western half of the country. So he's been sort of a, um, I don't know, I don't know what you would call it when two companies sort of partner together on projects, but that's what we're doing, uh, with the database side of things. And, uh, the other thing that I always liked about uh, his market analysis is his market analysis was always even just a little bit, it went even further than what I used to do, uh, where he would weight certain metrics based on uh, what he perceived to be the most important and would actually, he created a scoring model for metro areas, which was really interesting. And I, we worked together on that project as well. And it was uh, pretty eye opening and uh, definitely a really good, you know, good piece of data for, for us and him uh, when going out and, and really, you know, niching down to where we want to really invest, where we think the, uh, maybe the emerging markets are, mm-hmm. uh, so to speak. So it's, uh, it's been really good for our company because it started to, to allow us to put more focus on where we think the emerging uh, markets might be, where the rents might be uh, accelerated and things like that. Um, so it's been really enjoyable to work with him, and he's a he's an absolute genius when it comes to this stuff. Yeah, he's a great guy too, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, fantastic. Well, uh, so next week, Charles, let's talk about next week's show and and, and just give, give a, a primer of what we're going to cover as far as the database aspect, because that's this is that's really where it ties everything together. I mean, that that's the point in time to where 
you put everything that we've chatted about today and also at that point in the database, you take those trainings and you actually put into action, start building out this, this, uh, this proprietary database that I, I can tell you, as we mentioned beginning of the show, is really going to help separate you from the rest of the play- people in the space that are just searching mobilehomeparkstore.com, loopnet.com, and CoStar, and, and just kind of relying on brokers to bring them deals that are being shopped to, you know, hundreds or thousands of other potential buyers. And uh, again, it's just, I want to reiterate the fact that that's really what can help separate you today. Like in, in the type of environment that we're in, where we're reaching peak cycles in, in many different markets across the country, where everyone's chasing yield, there's always going to be another buyer out there willing to pay more than you for the same property. And uh, it, it's, it's really challenging to buy right in those types of environments. And the old saying goes, you make the money on the buy side of real estate. Okay. You don't make the money after you buy, you make the money at the buy. So you've got to buy right. And um, Charles, I mean, it just, just an example of that is, uh, and it worked out in our favor, but the one deal we have on the board uh, that we got from a broker, uh, we didn't overpay for it. But as soon as we started bidding on it, there were six other people we were bidding against larger operators. And uh, thankfully we, we had a threshold. We set that threshold and we bought the property for the exact number of what our threshold was. Uh, and so we still bought it right, but it got driven up a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, in a matter of a few hours, which is not fun. And it, that's the one thing that we don't have to do and we don't have to deal with when we're dealing with leads that are coming in from our database. I mean, I can't remember the last time that we actually got into a competitive type format with another buyer on a lead that came in through our mailings or our cold calling efforts. Do you, can you remember a time when that happened? You know, the times that it has happened, it's usually been one other person, not, it's not been dozens of other Mm -hmm. people. And um, I don't know, I guess we've, (laughs) we've enjoyed this, uh, I don't know, sort of a moat around our deal sourcing that we don't have, we've very rarely had to deal with that. And a lot of times we, you know, once the price gets bid up even somewhere close to like our threshold, I know for me at least, I almost lose interest in the deal Mm -hmm. um, because I just know how easy it is. I can just put together a thousand thousand letters, kick it out there that day and we'll have another deal tied up within a month or two. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know, it's tough to be in the, it's, it's really tough to be in the broker world. And uh, as a beginner, it's almost impossible. Yeah. I think the only way we won that deal was because we actually had experience and I don't think it had anything to do with the price. I mean, it did, we had to be close on price, but it was our experience and how easy it was to work with us. That was the reason we won that deal. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you, you bring up an interesting point there about just getting started in this space. And uh, it's just, it takes a lot of time and energy to, to, to get some traction. And what we found is the, the quickest way to get that traction is by doing what we're telling you here today. Learning the market, uh, learning the market analysis side of things, and then next week we're going to dive into the the database component. That really is the most fastest, most efficient way to gain traction if you want to start buying mobile home parks. And Charles, maybe you can share just a uh, a quick overview or primer of what they can expect next week in the database show. Yeah, next week. I mean, this is a lot easier to teach through video, but um, you know, with a podcast, you can still get it. Uh, but it's. Next week, we're going to go over how to, how to source a list. And uh, I'm going to show you how to do that. Really, you know, if, if you're outside of mobile home parks, I'll, we'll show you how that list sourcing goes, um, which will then make sense why it's really difficult in our space to get a list. Uh, and then I'll go through the steps to, to actually build a, a list that mirrors what you can buy in most industries. And then we'll take it a couple of steps further and we'll look at uh, how, to, how to dig into uh, to entities and find out who the managers, members, and presidents and vice presidents of entities are. We'll take it another step further. We'll we'll try we'll uh, we'll go through how to get accurate mailing addresses for them. Instead of sending it to their office, you're actually sending it to their house. And uh, and then we'll we'll look at how to get phone numbers as well. And we'll we'll sort of touch a little bit on how to market then, how to segment that list and, and market to different customer sets. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Good deal, man. Well, that's exciting. I'm excited for next week. And um, it's just, it's, it's, uh, I know it's a, it's a great pleasure of ours to help others in this business. I mean, we take phone calls and emails on a regular basis from those that have been listening to the podcast for a number of years and also from our you know, students that have gone through the academy. And uh, it's just, it's really great being able to help folks that 
a lot of a lot of them come to us, Charles, after they've already kind of banged their head against the wall a little bit by trying to buy something off of a loop net or <laughs> trying to buy something from a broker, right? They've they've got a headache by that point in time. They're like, I just I'm not finding deals, I'm not finding opportunities. And it, it really is pleasurable on our side to help them and kind of show them the way and hold their hand. So uh, with that being said, Charles, is there anything else we want to leave the listeners with before we say goodbye for the day? I think that's all I have. Okay. Well, good deal. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us. And that's all we have for today's episode. But I just want to remind you, go, be sure to go grab that free due diligence video training that I mentioned in the beginning of the show. You can grab that by going to dd.sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. Also, be sure to stop by the Mobile Home Park Academy website. It's at mobilehomeparkacademy.com. And you can listen to all the previous podcast episodes. I think that we've got 87 or 88 of them up there now. And uh I want to thank you again for stopping by and joining us here. And as always, it's been an absolute pleasure serving. Take care. Congratulations for taking the necessary steps to achieving massive success through the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Be sure to visit our website, mobilehomeparkacademy.com, to download your free digital ebook version of the 21 biggest mistakes investors make when buying their first mobile home park and how you can avoid them. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe to our free monthly mobile home park investing newsletter, which is jammed full of valuable tips, tricks, and strategies to help you accelerate your path to success as a mobile home park investor. More information about this podcast and its hosts can be found by visiting mobilehomeparkacademy.com.